still have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Now, there are a lot of people out there who um, believe that, you know, oh, I went to church today and I spoke in tongues, right? So that automatically means that I'm in the right standing with God. And that isn't necessarily true, okay? Um, what the scripture is saying here is that if I come to the house of God and I speak in tongues and everything and, and I'm crying in my... You know, I'm crying out unto the Lord and I'm pouring myself out, but I don't have the lifestyle to go with that. That tells me that I still have some work to do. Okay? And again, I'm not saying that, you know, maybe you've made a mistake here and there or what have you, and then you come to church and, and you pour out unto God, and He wants you to do that. He wants you to, to pour yourself out unto Him. He wants you to um, uh, make yourself available to allow the Spirit to move and, and uh, you know, to, for you to speak in other tongues and, and what have you, uh, to help build you up. Speaking in tongues edifies the person, it builds you up. Um, so as many times as you can, if you can allow yourself to speak with other tongues when you come to the house of God, I highly recommend it. But I also want everyone to remember that you must ensure that you try your best to have a lifestyle to go with that. How you conduct yourself in here in the house of God should be the same way you conduct yourself outside, right? Um, one thing that I, I feel the, the Lord pushing me to do more is to um, go deeper into prayer, i.e. pray deeper into the spirit. Um, now, many times I'll pray at home and everything, but I don't pray with other tongues at home sometimes. Um, I don't really allow myself to, to do that. I'm just focused on what I have to say. And it's kind of like I'm going through the motions, and I don't think God is pleased with that. So that's going to be something that I'm going to try to do in my prayer life as well. Um, but what he's saying here is that if I come to the house of God and I speak with tongues, but I don't have charity to go with it, it's like a tinkling symbol. It would be like me taking a drumstick and just tapping on the symbol over and over and over again. Eventually, it's going to become kind of annoying, right? And that's how it is. We can't just come to the house of God, speak with other tongues, praise and worship the Lord, and then go out and, try, and, and don't even attempt to try to uh, strive for that charity. Okay? We have to strive for it. We have to make sure that we're doing our best to have a life that goes with it. We are all a work in progress, right? But that word progress is important. We are a work in progress. We're working towards that pro progression in our relationship with God. All right, verse two, it says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So if you study the um, uh, book of first and second Corinthians, what you'll see here is that one of the main things is that themes in this, um, in this book is that uh, any gift, any spiritual gift that you can think of was being performed in this Corinthian church. Okay, any spirit, that's what the Bible says, any spiritual gift that you can think of was being distributed or being displayed in this church. So this church had a lot of gifted folks, right? And so what these people thought was that, oh, because I have these gifts, that means that I'm here in right standing with God. That means that we're holy. Just because an individual has you know, many great gifts and things of, things of that nature, then that automatically means that that person is living holy. Give you an example. Um, uh, I, was, I don't know if I should say his name. There is a preacher out there who, uh, I believe he's a Baptist preacher. And this man can preach. He's got the deep voice and the hot and all of that. And, and you know, and just gets the crowd excited and, he was gifted with um, being a great orator, right? He's, he's a great speaker, and he, he's able to speak to get the crowd, you know, excited and jumping up and down and all, all of that, right? Now, that may be great and wonderful, but if his preaching is in line with the Word of God, and if his lifestyle is in line with the Word of God, that gift means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Um, and uh, there was another example of somebody I wanted to... See, okay, I hope I don't offend anybody when I say this, but Martin Luther King, love him, love him, love him. Martin Luther King, he's awesome, right? Now, Martin Luther King, he had some smoke on his life. He had some smoke on his life with his spouse and things of that nature. Um, however, Martin Luther King, he was a very gifted orator. And because of some of the um, uh, uh, 
the great things that he did and those great speeches, it inspired, um, you know, minorities to rise up and to fight for their rights, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. However, he had to have a lifestyle to go with that gift that God gave him. Some of these gospel singers, right? There's a lot of uh, gospel songs out there and gospel singers that make beautiful, beautiful music, have these beautiful voices, and they have these big, beautiful churches, and they're just incredibly gifted, and, and you turn these songs on, and you'll start shouting and jumping up and down and hucking and 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 all of that, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, for them personally, if they don't have a life to go with it, God's not fully pleased with them. It means nothing, okay? So we have to have a lifestyle. That's, that's going to be the, one of the main terms here. I'm going to keep saying it over and over again. We have to have a lifestyle to go with those gifts, okay? All right. <clears throat> and let me make sure I'm keeping up with my notes. All right. Verse 3. It says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Um, before I got saved, you know, I believed that, oh, okay, I'm a nice person. I treat people with kindness and dignity and respect. Um, whenever I, when I was a kid, I would, anytime I saw a homeless person, I would try to give them a quarter or something if I had to change in my pocket. You know, little things like that. And I automatically thought, okay, because I do all these things, I'm, I'm automatically going to heaven. I'm a good person. Because that's what I was taught. The world always taught me. And even um, some of the nominal churches that I went to with my biological mom, they would say, oh, as long as you're nice people and you love Jesus and, and um, you know, all of that, then you're automatically stamped and approved to get into everlasting life, okay? Well, that's what society says. But that's not true. Again, I have to have a lifestyle that goes with it. Um, think of it like this, right? When you think of high school or, or, or even college, I'm in college right now, so we'll use college as an example. Um, the goal, the ultimate goal is to graduate. That is the ultimate goal, is to get that diploma in your hand so that you can graduate and move on with your life, right? Um, now, in college, I could be admired by all the students. I could be admired by all my teachers. I could be good at sports. I could be, you know, on the chess club and the debate club and, you know, just be this well-known individual. I could be a great volunteer who raises money and, and uh, gives donations to different programs to help improve the school and all these different things, right? But if I'm not studying my work, and if I'm not doing my homework, and if I'm failing every test, and if I get F's and D's in all my classes, I'm not going to graduate. Doesn't matter how nice I am, it doesn't matter how much I volunteer, it doesn't matter how good I am in sports and, and how many accolades I receive. If I'm not meeting the standard, I'm not going to graduate, okay? That's high school, elementary school, college, all of that. If I'm not meeting that standard by taking that homework home, going over my notes, going over the homework, and then you get a test at the end of, of that week or at the end of that semester, and if I don't pass that test, I'm failing every test, I'm not going to graduate. It's the same thing with our life with Christ. When you come to the house of the Lord, He gives you the lesson, right? He gives you what you need to know and what you need to use and what you need to take when you go out there in the world, right? So that's us kind of like we're coming to class. We're learning in class and we're taking notes. Then we go home and we do our homework, right? We go, we study our notes, we go over some of the scriptures that we've been taught, we meditate on it, we pray on it. Then, when you go out to your job, when you go out, you know, to school or in college, or even at home, you know, when you leave your, your prayer closet, so to say, so to speak, or when you leave, you know, when, you, when your prayer is done, or when you're done reading your word, then the tests start, right? And God puts those tests in your way, to see, to, to show you where you're really standing. And whether or not you pass or fail those tests, that's going to reflect the work that you've done beforehand. Just like in school, the grades that you get on your tests are a reflection of how much homework you've been doing, how much studying you've been doing, you know, how, much, how often you've been working hard, right? So you're going to be tested after this work comes forth. And if you pass that test, and you're passing test after test after test, that shows that you're working in charity. But if you're failing over and over and over again, then that shows that you've got a little more work to do. You've got to 
you gotta go, you gotta do a little more work. For me, incorporated fasting, I told y'all, um, I've been, been incorporating fasting. Now the Lord's been pushing me to go a little more, go try to go two days straight, I'm trying to go three days straight, right? The Lord's been slowly pushing that because I want this charity. In order for me to get that charity, I'm gonna have to suffer a little bit. I'm gonna have to make some sacrifices. He made the ultimate sacrifice for me, right? All I gotta do is fast every now and again. And then when I die and go to heaven, I won't have to fast no more, right? Praise the Lord. So that's what it's all about, okay? It's not just about us being nice or having gifts or anything like that. We have to have a lifestyle that goes with it. All right. Verse 4. It says, this is what charity does, right? Charity suffereth long <clears throat> and is kind. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been through this. How many of you have ever been going through a test? Or a trial, and you just feel the pressure of life weighing down on you, and that you're you kind of form a bad attitude as a result of it, and you come a little bitter towards other people. Someone will come to you, you all right? Leave him alone. Just, just I'm, I'm all right. You know, you just the, the the weight of life is just weighing down on you, and you're going through suffering and, and trials and tribulations, and then you start to see that because of it. You start getting an attitude with other people, or you start backbiting, or or you're you're unkind um, to those who are around you as a result of that. All that is is the pressures of life are revealing some uh, some toxicity in you. That's what it is, um, and and that's how it is for me. My Suffering that I go through manifests itself in a bad attitude. That's how I am sometimes. And I know that I'm like that, so I have to be mindful of that. All right, I'm going through a trial. All right, how, how have I been treating other people? You know, I'm going through a trial, and I've got to go to work today, and I've got all these different meetings. I'm going to be interacting with all these people. I have to make sure that I'm um, setting a good example of who a Christian is. All these people know I'm saved, so I can't get an attitude. I can't lash out and get up angry because I'm suffering right now. And so, um, if charity suffered long, and even though it's suffering long, it's still kind. It's still kind to, uh, uh, we should still be kind to our spouses. We should still be kind to our children. We should still be kind to our coworkers. Even though we're suffering, we still have to be kind in order for us to show that charity. Then it says, charity envieth not. Um, I think there's another, there's a scripture, I believe it's in Proverbs, where it says, Envy is the rottenness of the bones. Envy is the rottenness of the bones. And it doesn't say envy is the rottenness of other people's bones. It's the rottenness of your bones. You envying other people only hurts you. It's only hurting yourself. That it's like you're rotting on the inside. And um, if you think about envy, right? It's like this. Yeah, you're looking at other people. Oh, they have this and they have that. But then you've got more than some other people. Someone out there is, I'm always doing better than somebody, and somebody's always doing better than me, naturally speaking, right? We're all, there's different levels to it, praise the Lord. At the end of the day, what does it mean? We need to be satisfied with what God has given us. Because if I needed anything more, he'd give it to me. Because of the fact that I don't have a Lamborghini, <laughs> as much as I may want one, I don't necessarily need it. Because if I needed it, he would have given it to me, right? Praise the Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting those things, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, trying to be successful and saving a little bit of money so you have a nicer car or a nice home or things like that. But we should never, God, we should never get a blessing from God, be satisfied with it for a week, and see someone else with a, with a better version of what God has given us, and then automatically disregard what God has done for us and start envying other people. It'd be like you, um... Remember I told y'all that testimony about how my parents bought me that uh, that Power Ranger toy, the Zords or whatever? I don't know if, if, uh, if y'all remember. Yeah, y'all remember. So um, that was like the best thing under the sun that you could ever give me at that time, right? It was I was like excited to have that. But how do you think my parents would feel if, I, you know, they gave that to me for Christmas and then the following week I come home and I'm mad because one of my friends got something better. They spent all that money to get me that toy that I had been asking for for months. And then I'm like, well, so-and-so has something better, so I don't want to play with this anymore. It's kind of a slap in the face to my parents, right? So it's the same thing with our relationship with God. We cannot envy other people. Otherwise, we're not showing that charity. Then it says, charity vaunted not itself is not puffed up. Okay, we can't be puffed up. A lot of times, um, I don't know if you guys know any other uh, 
save folks, and save folks can do this. We have the uh, proclivity for this sometimes, where we're um, we're so quote unquote holy that we get pumped up. Like, oh, look at me, you know, I, I'm living by the standard. I'm this and I'm that, and you know, oh, you know, all these people on the job, they're just a bunch of sinners and, and all of that. That's not how we should be. Charity is not puffed up, okay? Um, verse 5, it says, and it's talking about charity still, doth not behave itself unseemly or shamefully, so we're not supposed to behave shamefully, right? Seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own. What that's talking about is, I'm not supposed to only, um, I'm not supposed to put my own needs and my own desires as a priority of the needs and desires of others. Um, when I go, when I sit down to pray, um, I try to make this a a, um, a habit where I acknowledge who God is first. Kind of like that, how, how uh, Jesus prayed. He's like, um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and kingdom come that will be done. I acknowledge who God is, then I pray for others. I pray for others, I put their needs above my own, then I pray for the things that I need, okay? Um, and I think another scripture says, uh, talks about not looking, not just looking at your own needs, but looking at the needs of others first, right? So that's what charity does. Um, is not easily provoked, is not easily provoked. Um, my previous boss, I know I've told y'all about her over and over again, I'm going to keep talking about it, I'm sorry. Um, but my previous supervisor, oh, oh my goodness, this woman, you say one thing, one thing that she doesn't like, and she would just blow up. And it was crazy because she would come in, hey everyone, good morning, it's going to be a great day, it's going to be a great week. As soon as she gets an email that she don't like, or as soon as someone's like a minute late, or says something that she don't like, oh, it's like the devil comes out to play. <laughs> it was crazy. And, and it was very scary and, and nerve-wracking for me because I couldn't just relax at my job. I was always on edge. And I was constantly analyzing, okay, I need to ask her this question, but how can I ask it in a way that's not going to make her blow up? I don't like, who likes being around people that are easily provoked? I, I don't like it. I, I don't like it because it's like you got to walk on the eggshells for that person. I want to be able to say what I want to say. I went to a, um, a baby shower for one of our soldiers uh, yesterday. Uh, no, not yesterday, Friday, Friday morning. And um, they played a game where you can't say, she was having a baby girl, and they played a game where you can't say baby, you can't say daughter, and you can't say something else, right? Man, I lost within like the first five minutes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I lost, right? Because um, I'm not, now I walk in circumspect with what I say, obviously, but Mean to tell me I can't say baby. I ain't trying to do. I ain't trying to walk on extra. Make sure you don't say baby. I don't like that. I just want to be able to say baby if I want to say baby. All right. So um, yeah, yeah. So I lost the game within like five minutes and and everything like that. But it's I had that's kind of how I felt being around that that individual. I had to walk on eggshells and be very careful about what I said. Otherwise, she would just lash out. Right. So we can't be like that. We can't be easily provoked. Jesus wasn't easily provoked. Right? There are plenty of examples. Look, look at Job. Look at all that Job went through. Now, Job, he, his Job's sin that he made was he ran his mouth a little too much, especially towards the end, right? Um, but he wasn't easily provoked. All those things kept happening to him back to back to back. And he never cursed God in, 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 uh, through that. So we have to be the same. All right. Um, not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. Okay? Um, you know, we have these fleshly bodies, we have our fleshly mind, and thoughts come to our minds. I don't think, we'll, we'll never be able to stop a thought from coming to our mind. The enemy is working on us all day. The enemy doesn't sleep, and he knows when we're exposed to that person on the job that we can't stand, and the enemy will whisper something in your ear, look at what they got on. Look, look at that. Or... <laughs> Or you might overhear something about that individual um, that could get that person in trouble. There's someone on my job right now who uh, this individual, she's been lying about appointments. So she'll lie and say that she has an appointment, but where is she? But she's really at home. 
And someone had drove by her house and said, uh, didn't so-and-so say that they were at a doctor's appointment? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, uh, no, she's sitting at home right now. And so the enemy immediately, now, and this person, we, I, I don't have anything personal against this individual, um, but the enemy kind of was like, oh, she's telling me that she's at home. You know, that's not my place. I mean, she, first of all, she got 19. Second of all, uh, you know, I'm not her supervisor. I'm not in charge of her. So I'm going to let God deal with it. But that thought came to my mind, and I rebuked it. And I was like, you know what? No, that's not but the devil. I'm not... Because I'm trying to be someone who, I don't want to be caught up in, you know, he said, she said, and, and all that's between her and my son, our supervisor. That ain't got nothing to do with me. Now, if my supervisor comes and asks me, I'm saying, so i got to tell the truth, right? If they come and ask me, hey, is, have you heard of so-and-so not being that? Unfortunately, yes, I have heard about that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not going to go out of my way to try and get that person in trouble, especially if I'm not their supervisor. Um, many times a thought will come to your mind about an individual or a thought will come to your mind to do something that you're not supposed to do. You have to get rid of that thought. Don't dwell on it. Don't keep dwelling on it. Okay. Um, many times men and women fall into fornication um, because and it's not just a, oh, I accidentally fell into fornication out of nowhere. Um, it's never like that. More often than not, they've already been stewing on that activity in their minds. And the devil's been working on them, and they've been allowing the devil to live in their mind rent-free. And then when they're faced with that test to, of, of uh, whether or not they're going to engage in fornication, then they fail because that's what they've been thinking about all the time. That's how it occurs. Um, if someone knows, if you know that you struggle with anger or you struggle with violence, you know, fighting and all of that, if you're always thinking about smacking somebody, or if you're always thinking about fighting somebody or punching somebody, then what's going to happen is when you're faced with contention or you're faced with an argument or what have you, nine times out of ten, you're probably going to get physical. You're going to end up acting on those thoughts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay? We become who, what our thoughts are. All right? So, it, but charity thinketh not evil. All right? When the thought comes to your mind, get rid of it. Think of something else. Praise the Lord. Ask for it, Lord. Um, cleanse my mind. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Help me to think on the things of you. Help me to see the way you see. Help me to think the way you think. And he'll do it for you. He has to do it for you because it's in his word, right? All right, verse six. This is something that hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, and I didn't think he was going to hit me like this. But it says, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Now, um, when I first saw that, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not excited when people are sinning. I don't get excited when, I don't rejoice when someone is involved in iniquity. But then I started thinking a little bit more, and, um, I, you know, I don't know if you guys see those YouTube videos, or, or maybe you've seen a video on, online or on the news or something, where um, someone's out in public, right, and they say something smart to somebody or something highly, highly offensive, or they call someone like a racial slur or something like that. And then the other person, sorry, I'm still dry. And the other person lashes out and puts hands on them, or like punches them, or smacks them, or something like that. And I've seen those videos, and many times I'll look at that and I'm like, yes, that's what they get, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad, yeah, yeah, that, you got exactly what you get. That's what you get for one in your mouth, right? Um, that's, that's not right. You can't, that, that's, that's not right. And um, God kind of got me on that. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with defending yourself if you're being physically attacked, but that's not God's way. If someone says something and you're not supposed to get violent back at that individual, I don't care what it is. Um, someone on the job asked me, what would you do if someone called you the N-word? And I said, to be honest, you know, if I'm walking in the spirit like I ought to, I'm going to react according to the spirit. And what would I do? I just pray for the individual. You just pray for him. You say, hey, I, you know, hey. I pray for you, you know, you, Lord, they don't know what they're doing. They're not saved. If they were saved, they wouldn't call me this word. So, you know what? I pray for you. Now, the old me would have been ready to, you know, box, okay? Now, I'm not I, I, I can't fight, uh, but, <laughs> but I would have did something, right? <laughs> Maybe I would have lost, who knows? I don't know. But um, <laughs> the old me would have been ready to scrap, praise the Lord. But um, even in those situations, I can't rejoice over someone Smacking someone in the face for saying something evil or for doing something wrong. I can't rejoice over that. 
Why? Because it's iniquity. I can rejoice over iniquity. Comedians, I love comedians. I love watching stand-up comedy and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with you know watching stand-up comedy here and there. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. If it's not like vulgar and all of that, right? But there are some comedians where they tell certain jokes and I'm just laughing, ha 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 ha. And the Holy Ghost will be like, why are you laughing at that? That'd be funny. Has it happened to y'all? When y'all, you, you see something or you watch something and you're like, oh, ha, ha, that's so funny, that's what they get. And the Lord will kind of tap on you on your shoulder like, hey, uh, why are you laughing at that, sister? <laughs> why you laugh at that big person falling down the escalator? Praise the Lord. Why you laugh at that, uh, at that kid that just walked into a pole or, or what happened? Why are you laughing? You know, you got to be careful of stuff like that. Praise the Lord. All right, so. Um, we have to be mindful of those things. We can't rejoice in iniquity, but we have to rejoice in truth. That's what it says. Yeah, but rejoice in the truth. When we, you hear the truth when it comes to the house of God, right? That's where we hear the truth. When the truth is coming forth, we should be rejoicing. Now, I'm not saying you've got to jump up and down and scream hallelujah, but you should be rejoicing in your heart knowing that you're hearing the difference between good and evil. You should be rejoicing in your heart that God has given you what you need to make it because not everyone out there in the world has that. Not everyone out there in the world has that privilege to receive what God has for them, right? So we should be rejoicing in that. Same way we rejoice, you know, at the football games and at the basketball games and you know at the gospel concerts and all of that. We should be rejoicing that same way when we come to the house of the Lord, okay? All right. <clears throat> uh, verse 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth. All things. That's what charity does, all right? It's able to bear anything that comes its way. I can bear anything that comes my way because I have the Holy Ghost. Okay? We have to remember that. If Jesus lives in me, how can I say that I can't make it? That's almost like me saying, God, you ain't powerful enough to get me through this, so, you know, I'm going to just go back to doing what I used to do. You're not powerful enough. You're not good enough, Lord. So, you know, I, I'm just going to be depressed or I'm going to sulk and, and be negative and angry and bitter towards everybody else because this problem that I have is too great for me to solve. This, flesh, this problem that I have in my flesh, I'm not able to overcome it. You're not enough, so I'm just going to keep on doing it. And we know that that's not true. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus is all power. He has all the might. He has all the power. He has all the knowledge, all the wisdom. And he's prepared to give it to us if we accept it. All right? And um, we also have to remember, uh, <clears throat> if God allowed it to happen, I can make it. If he allowed it to come my way, that's a sign that he's going to equip me to make it through. He's not going to bring something in my way that's going to destroy me. Okay? Now, I may allow it to destroy me by giving in to it or doubting him or giving in to my flesh, praise the Lord. But, Lord, you brought it my way, so that must mean we, we've got to go through this together, right? Because he's with us, praise the Lord. He's always with us. I, there's been so many times, and I'm sure you guys have felt the same way, where you're going through it and you're in the struggle and you're in the fire and that pressure's coming down on you. And it's so bad to where it's like, Lord, are you even with me right now? And I must be in this thing alone because uh, things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And you haven't done anything about it, Lord. I haven't been able to get out of this trial yet. What is going on? This disease that I'm sure, this chronic disease, it's come back. You know, that back pain has come back. Uh, uh, you know, that those headaches, the migraines have come back, Lord. What is going on? What are you doing? And we have to, he's always with us. If you have the Holy Spirit, you've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, he's with you, in you. And even if you don't have the Holy Spirit, God, he's everywhere all the time, all at once, right? Uh, it's important for you to get the Holy Spirit so that you can have the strength to overcome these things, praise the Lord. But um, <clears throat> he is with you in the fire. It's kind of like this, right? Um, when you're cooking, or say for instance, you're boiling water, and you have like some type of milk-based product in that water, right? You can't walk away from that pot, especially if you have milk in it, because what's it, what's going to do? It's going to over it's going to overflow, right? So, um, how many of y'all have like made grits or oatmeal, cream of wheat, stuff like that, right? You cannot walk away from that. You got to sit there and watch it, and you're stirring it, and you see it's not cooking right, so then you'll turn the heat up a little bit more, 
because you want it to be a good finished product. You want to be able to share it with the family, and you don't want to be the one at the cookout with crunchy grits. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right? So you, you turn that heat up, right? And so it starts boiling and boiling and boiling. Then it maybe the heat's a little too high. Then you turn the heat down. And, and it begins to fall. Before it boils over and gets all over the stove and gets up under there and the smoke comes up and people are like, oh, so-and-so can't cook. Praise the Lord. You, you turn it down before it boils over. Right? But you're there watching it um, and then you keep turning it up, turning it down, turning it up, turning it down until you have the finished product that you've been wanting. Okay? That's how God is with us. Sometimes in our lives, he, he, he's trying to get us to charity. That's the ultimate goal here. He's trying to bring us to charity. And in order for us to have that charity, he's got to turn the heat up on our lives sometimes. That heat produces faith. It, there's so many things that the pressures and the trials and tests of life produce in us. And that's what God is trying to do. So he'll turn the heat up, right? But he doesn't just turn the heat up and walk away. He'll turn the heat up and he's just watching. He's right there with you watching you. And before things get too out of hand, or before things boil over, or right before you may think, oh, it's over, it's done, I'm not going to make it, he'll turn that heat down. He's not going to let it overboil. Now, you might let it overboil. Maybe you jump to a different burner because you think you got it under control. <laughs> or maybe you just jump out of the pot and go sit on the couch somewhere, right? Um, but we have to remember God is in control. We're his workmanship. He's working on us. We're not working on him. We're not. Yeah, we're working on ourselves as well. But he's working on us. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. So he's in control. He's right there with us when we're in that fire. Just let God do what He has to do. And even in the face of death, and I thought about this for a while too. Um, there was a pastor, and I think I might have shared his testimony with y'all before. There was a pastor whose son had sickle cell, and I don't know if y'all know how sickle cell is. Sickle cell is kind of like a death sentence, is what they say. And they say the average person with sickle cell doesn't make it to their like early 20s or, or early 30s or something like that, right? So it's a chronic illness. <clears throat> and um, I think he said that his son had passed away at 16 years old. Um, he was very, very sad and it was a tough trial. And, um, you know, when his son died, he prayed and he was like, Lord, why did you take my son? We've been praying. We've been fasting. We've been faithful. My son has been faithful. My son is baptized in Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost. He's been faithful. He's been praying. He's been fasting. Even with his disease, you know, he's been sacrificing and, and praying for you to, to heal him and to sustain him. Why did you take my son after all the good, or not all the good that I've been doing, but after me living holy, put it like that, right? After me living holy and sacrificing all this, with all this fasting, why did you take my son? And God said, I took your son because he's mine. Right? He told me, I took your son because he's mine. And you kept praying, Lord, relieve us of this suffering. Lord, relieve my son of his suffering. I, I deemed him ready for eternal life, so I relieved his suffering by taking him out of this world. And I relieved your suffering because now you don't have to see your child suffer anymore. That was my version of me relieving you of your suffering. So even on our very own deathbed, if we're living a life of charity and we're living holy, we have nothing to worry about. Because it's like, Lord, I want you to heal me. I want you to, to help me to get through this, this, this disease or what have you. And if God takes us, that's his version of getting us through that disease. That's his version of taking us out of that suffering. Now, I'm not saying that you know, when we're on our deathbed, we should be praying to die. No, that's it. That's not what I'm saying. We want to fulfill God's will on this side. We want to continue to be a, a witness and example unto other people. But at the same time, um, God didn't fail because he took you out of this world. That was his way of saying, you're ready. You're ready to come with me. You're ready to live with me in eternity. So I'm going to relieve your suffering by calling you home. Okay? So um, it beareth all things, it believeth all things, it endures all things, right? We should be able to endure the suffering in this life because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the power to endure it. All we got to do is endure it. All right? He's already given us, he's equipped us with what we need. All right. Verse 8. <clears throat> Charity never faileth. It never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
Um, I didn't include the scripture, man. Is it okay if we jump to verse 11? I'm sorry. I should have uh, included that in there. Something told me to. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, when we come into salvation and we're striving for that charity, right? We have to remember this. We have to make this, we have to make a calling and election sure, right? Verse 11, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. So when we were in the world, or even when we first came into Christ, right, we had certain a certain lifestyle. We had a certain mindset. We had certain attitudes. We had certain thoughts, right? That were based upon what we had learned. Remember, we were talking about that conscience earlier. Your conscience comes from what you learned, right? And so you're basically living based upon what you know, based upon what you've been given, right? But when you come into Christ and you're living for God and you're progressing in the faith and you're growing and learning more and more about God, it's like, okay, my childish ways are done and over with. Now that I am a man or now that I am mature in my faith, I can't act like I used to act anymore because I'm no longer that person. I'm not unsaved anymore. I'm saved now, so I can't act like I'm unsaved. I'm not a child anymore. I'm not unlearned in the scriptures. I've got the knowledge and the wisdom to know the difference between good and evil. So guess what? I have to live it now. I'm not a child anymore, right? I'm mature in the Lord. I, <clears throat> but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, there are certain things, again, that God will take from us. God will take them from our, our predilection or from our taste. Like I told you all before, um, I had uh, I used to be a smoker, and um, it didn't take long for smoking to stop. It, there were some things that I had to do to stop it, right? But it, it went away a little bit easier than my temper. My temper is something I have to work on daily. That is a daily, daily thing. The daily, daily, daily. And my mouth, like I told y'all before, is sometimes it's hard for math. Sometimes I just want to say what I want to say, and I can't do that if I want to make it happen, right? Um, so that's something that I have to put away daily. There were certain things I put it away once, and it's been gone, and I ain't, and I ain't picked it up, and I ain't wanted to pick it up. But then there's some things I got to wake up. I wake up, and maybe because I haven't been praying like I ought to, or because, thank you, thank God for you, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm over here hackling. All right. Um, yeah, there, there are, maybe there are some things that um, that I haven't been doing in my life, and then I wake up, and like I said, I put away the childish things the day before, right? But then I wake up in the morning, and I'm, and I'm in a bad attitude, and I got that childish thing in my hand again. I have to put it away again. Sometimes we, there are certain things we might want to pick up, or certain predilections that we have, certain attitudes that we have. We have to continue to put it off. We have to continue to put it away daily, right? All right. Talking about charity, praise the Lord. All right, so now we're going to jump to 1 Corinthians, same chapter, but we're going to go to verse 13. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I didn't finish it. Oh, Lord help me. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so yeah, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's progression, all right? Um, we're going to jump to verse 13. 13. Verse 13, yeah. And, all right. <clears throat> and... These are the three things that every saint needs in order to make it. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. All right? So we need faith. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We can't please God without faith. All right? And we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So an example of your faith is the simple fact that you all are here today, hearing what God has to say, right? Your faith is being built up, your faith is being, uh, um, you know, solidified, because you're coming to the house of God, you're hearing what He has to say, and you're going to apply these words to your daily life. Praise the Lord. All right. Then, hope. 
um, hope that Jesus is coming back. Um, you know, if you worry about Jesus coming back, then that tells you you probably got some work to do. <laughs> and there have been times where I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm like, Lord, I'm, I'm ready for you to come back. I'm ready. Let's go. And then there are other times where I'm like, oh, Lord, I, I messed up on the job today. I, I said such and such to so-and-so. Um, they, they said, uh, uh, you look like a bug-eyed, fish-eyed fool. And I said, well, you another one. <laughs> right? Praise the Lord. I, hey, someone said something crazy to me. And I said, your mama. <laughs> right? <laughs> Lord, I'm not ready. Don't let me let me purify myself, Lord. Let me let me cl cleanse my heart. Let me. I want to be in right standing with you. Let me, give me some time to get it together, Lord. Please help me. Help me. I want to be ready. But we should be looking forward to the coming of the Lord. We should be looking forward to the Bible says uh, it, um, one of the scriptures that talks about the coming of the Lord and, and prophecy and all of that. And it says, comfort one another with these words. The talking about Jesus Christ coming back should comfort us. Because that's an end to all the suffering that we're going through, right? That's what we should be looking forward to him coming back for us. Praise the Lord. Um, those are the things that we should hope for. No more pain, no more death, no more turmoil, no more suffering, no more fasting. Oh, Lord, every time I fast, I'm like, damn, oh, Lord, I can't wait till I got to do this no more. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because I love me some food. All right. But it says, charity out of all of these three, the greatest of these is charity. Why? It's because it is the life of Christ manifested in your character. That is the greatest thing you can have is the life of Jesus Christ manifested in the way you live. Jesus should look at you and should look at me and see himself. When other people look at you, they should see Jesus. When you look at yourself in the mirror, now I'm not saying now, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you see another person, you might need to call a doctor. But, <laughs> praise the Lord. But when, you look, when you're examining yourself, when you're examining how you're living, how you're treating other people, you should be able to say, thank you, Jesus, God. You, you, Lord, you've given me the power to live like you. You've given me the power to act like you, to walk like you, to talk like you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Continue to help me grow, right? You can be perfect in what you know. We won't be perfected until we put on those glorified bodies, but you can be perfect in what you know. Lord, help me to be perfect in what I know. Lord, I know it's not right for me to steal. I know it's not right for me to gossip. I know it's not right for me to lie. So, Lord, help me to be perfect in what I know. Help me to act according to your word, okay? That's how the life of Christ is manifested in our character. All right, we got two more verses. Or yeah, two more, two more verses. We're gonna go to Philippians chapter three, verse twelve through fourteen. Philippians chapter three, verse twelve through fourteen. I'm feeling all right this morning. How about y'all? Amen. Amen. I'm feeling all right. Philippians chapter three. Verse 12 through 14. <clears throat> All right. Good. So pages turning. All right. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 12. <clears throat> Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, right? So we're talking about that perfection. You can be perfect in what you know, but you won't be perfected. We still have these moral, fleshly bodies. These, um, this flesh is, is sinful, right? So we haven't put on that glorified body yet. But here's what we do. But I follow after. I follow after. If that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, what are we in pursuit of? I'm in, we're in pursuit of something. What are we following after? What are we in pursuit of? Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Nine times out of ten, when a saint falls or when a saint backslides, 
more often than, than not, they go back to what God had already brought them out of. Um, earlier in my walk with Christ, and even now, um, the things that try to drag me back to what God brought me out of are, are, are I'm sorry, the things that try to, you know, be ankle biters and try to get me to fall or try to get me to sin are not things that I've, ne that I've never had a predilection for, or they're, they're not things that I've never had a desire for, right? Um, I, I don't like stealing. I, I've never had an issue with, with stealing. Uh, I've never had that issue, right? So that's not something that I'm ever tempted with. Praise the Lord. The devil's only going to try to, he's going to try to tempt you with things that he knows that you like, right? And so what ends up happening for all of us is that the devil's trying to get you back into what God brought you out of already, okay? So we have to forget those things that are behind. We cannot, we should never, and, I, and I've heard some, some saints do this, I'm not here, but um, in other churches or whatever, where, and even, I've heard pa pa some pastors say, yeah, you know, back in the day, you know, I used to be making money, and I used to be on the block, and talking about their old life as if they miss it. And I'm like, brother, are, are you still out there? Because you're talking about it as, <laughs> as if you, you're ready to go back to the block. Like, what's going on, brother? <laughs> it shouldn't be like that, right? We should not have a... Uh, Predilection for the things that God brought us out of. If you're constantly meditating on those things and tugging at those things, giving it a little bit of attention here and there, playing with it or what have you, eventually you're going to fall into it. Or eventually you're going to uh, go back to what you used to do. We have to forget it. Not only that, but I think I said this last week, we should hate sin. We should hate it. We should hate it. We should not look at our old lives and, and all the attention we used to get or what have you, whatever it may be, and think positively on it. We should think, have negative feelings for it and towards it, and we should be thankful that God brought us out of it because I still know some folks that are living the way I used to live and they're miserable. Some of them are dead. Some of them didn't make it through, right? So I'm thankful for that, but we should forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. Um, there are God has called each and every one of us to a certain purpose, right? Now the purpose, the overall purpose is charity, right? That's what we're talk, talking about today. But um, and Brother Perry, I hope I don't if you don't mind I'm just Brother Perry as an example. Or um, like God might be calling Brother Perry to I don't know be, be an usher or to be a minister or to be a preacher. If He's not working towards those things. If he's look, if he's too busy in the past and he's not looking forward, he's never going to be able to fulfill what the purpose that God has for him. Um, Sister Rachel, they, God might have called her to, um, you know, sing in the choir or to be an usher or whatever. It, it could be anything. I'm just using that as an example. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Sister. <laughs> but, but. Um, that God might have a calling on her life or a calling on, he, he does have a calling on every single one of our lives. There, every single one of us has a gift, something natural that comes to us that we can use for the edification of the body of Christ. And that we can also use to minister unto others and to bring others to Christ, right? But if I'm too focused on the past, I'm not going to be able to take that step of faith to walk into the purpose that God has for me. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss the mark. I'm going to miss it, right? And that's unfortunate because if you look at it, in the future, there may be souls that you're going to win. There may be, you know, uh, uh, you know, you might be singing in the choir and, and the way you're singing or, or the way you're ministering unto the body, that might inspire someone to repent. Hearing those verses, those, those gospel songs, it could inspire someone to repent. So that's just an example of that, right? So we have to forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That word press implies that there's some opposition. Um, if when you when you're going through one of those doors or whatever that have like the, the two way doors or whatever, you you ain't even got to really press on. You can just walk through it, right? But when you press on for something, that means that there's something pressing against you, right? 
That's the world. The three things that are against us is the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those three things are pressing against us, right? But we we can't just let it push up against us and just wash over us, and then we just lay there and take it and just do whatever we want to do and just let life, you know, do whatever it wants to do with us, right? We have to press back. We have to push back on it by living for God, by hearing the word, by acting on that word, by fasting, by praying, by putting God first in everything that we do. That's our verse of pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All right. So we're in pursuit of charity. Um, and we have to remember what our priority is, okay? We're, I'm not in, we should be in pursuit of fame or attention or fleshly desires or, or pleasure or success or glory or, or even a spouse, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with searching for a spouse, but that shouldn't be your number one pursuit, okay? Because your spouse isn't going to get you to heaven, right? Fame isn't going to get you to heaven. Fame isn't going to get you that charity. Um, we have to pursue charity. We have to pursue that life of Christ manifested in the believer. Why is that? What, 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 do we, what do we want to come to at the end of that? We're going to go to our last scripture, Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. And I love the scripture here. It's always encouraging me whenever I'm being tested or whenever the enemy tries to make me think that I'm living safe for no reason or that I'm living for God in vain. This is a reminder of what we're looking for. All right? This is what we have to look forward to, what every saint has to look forward to. All right. So this is what we want the Lord to say to us. Verse, uh, Matthew 25, verse 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's a beautiful scripture right there. What a time it's going to be. Can you imagine how that's going to feel? Hearing, hearing God say, you did, you did well, Amen. and you won. You enter into the joy of the Lord. Right? Isn't that... You're going to look back on the suffering. You're going to look back on the sacrifice. And you're going to say, it was worth it. You're going to say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God that he gave me the power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. The only way we're going to overcome those things and we're going to press toward that mark is by having that charity. The perfect life of Christ manifested in a believer. Praise God. That's all I got. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God is good. And greatly to be praised. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a quick offering. It's good to see all the saints and the people of God. Amen. I got a short little message and I'll be sharing with the church. Amen. Just had a nice trip. Went to Las Vegas. And praise God. And one of the saints was itching for the white and one of them fight gamble. Praise God. I said a big old no. No. Now I was tempted. Praise God. I've seen all the machines, all that money you think you're gonna get. But praise God, you have to overcome that temptation. I was supposed to go I was on my family. Let's go in and out, but we didn't make it. Praise God. We went to Gordon Ramsay. We went to Gordon Ramsay Burger. Amen. I don't want to get sued. I'll tell you how the service was at the church. Praise God. <laughs> uh, <I'm good. laughs> Praise God. But we had a good time. Let's bless this offering. Lord, we ask that you bless this offering for the attendant meeting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I remember one time I was on the cruise ship and there was this game and it had a big circle. And if you could put this bar right between the circle, you got all this little iPads and all that. And then I was walking and it was one of the managers of the cruise ship. I said, man, come here for a second. I said, can you, can you? And the choir can come up. I said, can you play this game? He looked at me, he looked around. He said, these games are rigged. I said, oh, no wonder. Can you, you now imagine, if you've been to Las Vegas and you see the hotels and the artwork and everything, the people ain't giving away money, folks. They making money. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. So, you know, you'd be better off paying your tithes and offering. God said, I guarantee to bless you. Don't put it that loud. Amen. 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 I see when people spend so much in lottery, it's a shame. Amen. 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 Quick testimony. It's good to see Brother Ruiz. Brother Ruiz knew me when I was 16 years old. I was in my church. Amen. He, he was praying people through, getting people baptized when I was a little teenager. Amen. Brother Ruiz, why don't you testify and brag on Jesus a little bit? It's good to have him in service with us. It's always good, Pastor, to be in the house of God. This uh, June 8th is uh, 47 years I was baptized in the forgiving, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They went to the Lord in class about that. From that time, all glory to God. Haven't smoked, haven't drank, haven't picked up any joints. Yes, I was the black sheep of the family. But let me tell you, living for God, there's nothing like it. Amen. Amen. It is the best of the best. June 12th, which was my birthday, I was baptized in Jesus in <coughs> 1977, 47 years ago. Right. Church, the devil's a liar. Re right. Rejoice in the Lord. Be full of God. Watch and pray. He's coming back. Amen. Amen. Right. Jesus. So I vow I 
Man, I got a simple message today. I refuse to go back to my old lifestyle. I refuse to go back. We got to understand in our Christian walk, our first scripture reading will be Hebrews 10 and 23. We understand. I'll go ahead and read that. We'll start that off. And it says, Hebrews, you know, my standing for honor of the reading of the word of God. Hebrews 10, 23 to 26. Ooh, to 27, I'm sorry. Hey, Amen. It's good to see some of the older saints that I grew up with. Sister Divine, Brother Riz, Sister Freeman. Hey, Amen. They knew me when I had burgers in my nose. Praise God. <laughs> he used to get on me. Hey, Amen. He used to encourage me, pray with me. Hey, Amen. Sister Divine and her husband used to come on, brother, pray, pray, pray. And he taught me how to pray. He's the first person to pray with me when I got the Holy Ghost, Sister Divine. Amen. Hey, man, he prayed with me when I was 16 years old. Man, we used to wear me out. Praise God. But we got it done in Jesus' name. The Bible says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. That means when you believe in God, you start walking with God. Don't waver. Hey, Amen. Don't be in church, out of church, in church, out of church. Made up mind, unmade up mind. Hey, don't waver your walk with God. For the Bible says, for he is faithful, that promise. And then what has God promised us? He has promised us an opportunity for eternal life. He has promised us gifts and beautiful things in this life and things to come. Hallelujah. Next scripture. Promise. For he is faithful, that promise. And let us consider one another. To provoke unto love and to good works. You may be seated. Amen. I, I think I, I had to repent because I was complaining and murmuring about things. And I'm like, Lord, forgive me for my murmuring and complaining. Because I started hearing my son start murmuring and complaining. I was like, man, I don't want to be that kind of example. Praise God. And before I hit the scripture, I'm going to go to my intro context. And our Christian walk is a transformative change occurs when we know Christ. This change is so powerful that we must guard against returning to the former ways of life. The Apostle Paul, in his letter, addresses the danger, the futility of going back to what we've been delivered from. Our commitment must be to continually press forward. Paul said, I press forward to the mark and the high calling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Living out our faith and never desiring the chains from which we've been set free to be in bondage again. Hey Amen. God has called us to be a greater example than what we used to be. Hey Amen. God called us out of darkness that we won't return back to the darkness. Hey Amen. But he brought us out of darkness to bring us into the light. Hey Amen. We got to understand that so many people that we know, that we walk around and that we're around do not know truth. They do not possess truth. They don't have an understanding of God's laws, His ways, and His word. And we know the word. And we know about the delivering power of God. Amen. The next scripture says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much as more as you see the days of approaching. Amen. We need to be in church more as we understand the days of approaching for the Lord. Verse 26, it tells us, For if we sin will after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for our sins. Verse 27, But a certain fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation that should devour the adversaries. God saying, Hey, you know better. You better do better. Now we understand that also when we think about I'm not turning back. God's thoughts are so more superior than our minimized minds. For in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 55 and 8, the book of Isaiah instructs us the insights of God's intellectual thinking pattern. Isaiah 55 and 8 says what? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Belief in God is the first step in preparing your mind for the repentance. Then repentance prepares your heart. We're going to go to Matthew 3 and 1. We understand the first thing about coming to God is believing in God. 
The next step is repenting. Matthew 3 and 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent! Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. We got to clean up our lives. We got to clean up our lifestyle. Why? Heaven's at hand. God has promises and things that he wants to do for his people. Amen. And the Bible teaches us there was many things that God could not do because of their unbelief. Amen. God wants to fill this church full of people that want to love him, that want to walk with him, that desire to know him. And he wants to use every single one of us as an individual to be used for his plan in the kingdom of God. And John the Baptist came preaching, repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hey man, we gotta get our life right. We gotta get our heart right. We gotta get our spirit right. Hey man, where does that come? In an hour, taking that sweet hour of prayer. As we talked about earlier, if you fail the plan, you plan to fail. Hey man, you need to set a time for prayer, study, dedication for the word of God. For those that are seeking and tearing for the Holy Ghost, make it a, your duty every day to find some time to start to pray. Start to worship God. Start to speak out loudly. Start to entertain the presence of God. And the presence of God will come down. The Bible says, deep call us to deep. Amen. If we start seeking God, God will seek us. Draw nigh to God and God will draw nigh to you. When we talk about the word repentance, it means to think differently. Afterwards, they can reconsider your moral way you think. Amen. But we, before we come to God, anything goes. Whatever makes the flesh happy, whatever tickles the flesh, we just go on about and do it. But once we repent, we think morally different. Why? Because i got to have a lifestyle that's pleasing to God. A change in one's mind. I used to think that doing this was right. I used to think doing this was right. Whatever I thought made me happy and pleased me. But now i got to change of mind. I want to do the things that are pleasing unto God. Amen. John 3 and 3. We can understand after a change of mind through repentance. Then after that, we must adhere to the scriptures. Adhere to the scriptures and be born again of the water and of the spirit. Salvation. Hey, I don't want to go back to that old lifestyle, but we got to get converted to the new lifestyle. Hallelujah. John 3 and 3. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. This is a transformation. We have to be born again. As I was telling the individual, the reason why so many people struggle with living for God and doing right, you haven't been born again. You're full of that old nature, that old fleshly man, that old desires. The Bible says a carnal mind is enmity against God. That's why we can't please God. That's why you can't please God walking in the flesh. You have to walk in the spirit. Amen. And that way you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Amen. Because they're contrary one to another. Amen. You got to learn how to walk with God. Amen. And the more you start to pray, the more you fast, the more you seek God's word, the more you get enlightened to do the things of God. Amen. Just as I shared the story before, my son started reading the Bible. He said, Dad, I'm starting to like this. Amen. Why? I said, son, you start to feed that, feed that inner man. And once you feel that inner man, it desires more. It desires more prayer. It desires more word. Praise God. Never lose the anointing. Never lose your walk with God. Amen. I was observing a person that used to be in my old church. And uh, she started her own church. And I remember that lady used to preach, Brother White, under the influence, under the anointing of God. I remember seeing her shake the church up. And I was like, we can get anointed like that. And I was like, wow. And it's inspired me. But now I see her preaching today. She has all the words and has all the drive. But there's no spirit and anointing behind it. You can feel the difference. For it said, Nicodemus, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. We got to understand when it talks about born from the spirit, he's born from above, born from the divine. Born of the water is being baptized, John 3 and 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7, Marvel not, I say unto thee, 
you must be born again. A lot of churches in our denom uh, denominational world de deceive people by teaching you must just accept the Lord as your personal Savior and then you're automatically saved. You say the sinner's prayer, you make the confession of faith, or you can just say a prayer at your deathbed and you're automatically saved. Or you might be a person that loves the book of Ephesians and say you're saved by faith, not by works, that any man can boast. I met a man that says, I'm saved by faith, he don't have to do anything. I said, you don't have to do anything. He said, I don't have to do anything. I'm automatically saved. I said, why are you going to waste your time going to church? He went, Ugh. Hallelujah. Paul said, no, no, James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 8. The Bible says, the wind blowing. <sighs> where it listen, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it cometh. Or where it goes. And so it's everywhere which is born of the Spirit. That sound is a Greek word called glossia, tongue, the language. There's going to be a sound, the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Speaking in tongues is evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. But then after that, we're going to know them by their fruits. Amen. There's a lot of people that speak in tongues, but they ain't got no more Holy Ghost than the devil. Praise God. So by your fruits, we're going to know them. Fruits of love, peace. Joy. Amen. Submission to spiritual authority. Submission to God. Submission to His Word. But we're raising a generation that's submitting to everything but God. Mm. Amen. I'll give you an Old Testament witness of speaking in tongues. Isaiah 29, 10 through 12. Hallelujah. Isaiah 10 and 29, 10 through 12. For the Lord hath poured out upon the spirit of the deepest sleep. And have closed your eyes and the prophets. No, I say not 29. Is that right? Oh, 28. I'm sorry. 28, 10. Father, mercy. I said, man, something right here. I say 20. I, I, put it, I put it in wrong, but copy the right. That's my fault. Sorry about that, baby. Amen. There we go. 28, 10. For precept must be upon precept. Line upon line. Hear a little and there a little. 28 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. Verse 12. To whom he said, This is the rest where we should cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they will not hear. Amen. Speaking in tongues is even in the Old Testament. With stammering lips and a new tongue shall he speak to his people. Amen. We got to understand as we teach and we endeavor to hold to the truth, we're going to have people come here that don't accept the truth. Amen. There was a few services ago. I was having a spiritual debate with a visitor, and he wasn't saying anything, but the, through the Holy Ghost, I was able to read his mind and see, to get the knowledge. And every question he had, I was sitting there answering in the Word of God. Amen. We just pray for him. Hopefully he comes back. But a lot of times when you come to the church, we recross your theology because we back it up with the Bible. It's not about man's philosophy. It's not about man's wisdom. It's not about man's intellect. It is about the Word of God. Amen. That's all we got. Now I invite people to church. What you got? We got the Word. That's all we got. We got the Word. And that's what's going to save us. That's what's going to sustain us. And if you come to church for anything else other than the Word, you will be deceived. Mark 16, 17. Jesus went on to say, Hallelujah. Mark 16 and 17. And these signs. I'm sorry. I'm going a little too fast. I'm sorry. And these signs shall follow those that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak and new with new tongues. Amen. And verse 18. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Note. He says in the name. In the book of Mark 16 and 17. Then when we jump to Luke 24, 47. What does Luke 24, 47 says? Give me another witness about the name. And repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Uh, among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Baptism in the name of Jesus is very important. That is the way the church got baptized. You know, amen, we was talking to the Sunday school kids today. They were learning. What scripture were y'all learning today? Say it loud. Acts. 
And I told him the easy, hey man, I told him the easy way to learn. Remember Acts 238? You got an axe, wham! You got 238. <laughs> Acts 238. Praise God. The one lady got robbed, and robbed, uh, they said the burglar got in her house. She said, freeze, Acts 238. And he just waited for the cops. They said, why are you waiting here? He said, man, that lady said she had an axe in 238. So I was not moving. Praise God. That might work. Hallelujah. Don't try this at home, folks. Acts 238. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Repent. We talked about it as a change of mind. Amen. Receive the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Jesus Christ inside you. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. Amen. As Brother Rich was talking about, he got the Holy Ghost 40-something years ago. I got the Holy Ghost 1996 on the September. And nobody can tell me I didn't get the Holy Ghost. I was speaking in tongues, feeling the power of God. I was worshiping and had made up my mind. I wanted to walk with God. I repented that day. And I was weeping and crying, seeking God's face. And it is God's love gift to every single one of us. And at that time, I was praying out the altar, and I repented that day. And I, was, I told Brother Chris Barnes, I said, I'm getting the Holy Ghost today. I, I'm getting it today. I repent. And I came to the altar, and I was like, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. God, I worship you. Oh, hallelujah, I'm going at it. And the next thing I was like, Man, I have the Holy Ghost already. And when I started to drop my hands, it was like something, that old nature, that old carnality lifted off of me. And the Holy Ghost came down upon me. And I started speaking in tongues. And I had never been the same since. Amen. And what was God showing me? It's not about you. It's his love gift. All I had to do was receive it. All I had to do was lift up my hands and submit myself. Submit my mind. Submit my heart. Submit my will to God. A lot of times when we're seeking for the Holy Ghost, there's things in our life that we refuse to let go. There's things in life that we want to hold on to our pet sins. You know, your pet sin is like one time I was at Fifth Street Park. And it was a beautiful, Fifth Street was a beautiful little turtle. And I had a fish tank. I was like, I want to take that beautiful turtle home. And I took that little turtle home and I put it in my little fish tank. And it was so cute. And that's how some of y'all treat sin. You pet it, you rub on it, you massage it, and you just love on it. And as I'm laying in the bed, Brother White, something started crawling from under. I'm like, oh, what in the world is that? It was leeches that were in that turtle, and they started coming out of the shell. And I was like, oh, I am not going to sleep, Brother Ruiz, I kill all these leeches. The next time I'm going to wake up, and they're going to be on me. I'm like, ah! Praise God. I have a wife right then. I've had to call 911. Help! 911! He got me! Praise God. So I heard about this little salt trick. I got the leeches. I put salt in them. They start curling up. Like in the movies. Praise God. But I had realized I got comfortable with that little pet turtle. You realize sometimes you get comfortable with that little pet sin. But you got to understand that's going to grow up and bite you. Amen. It just reminds me of the story that the, the big Indian chief had. And a little kid was out playing in the jungle and he had a little black cat. And he brought it home and the Indian chief was against him said, do not keep the black cat. And the mom fought the Indian chief said, no, no, this is my son wants this cat. And they fought against the Indian chief. And he said, okay, you can have it. The next thing you know, that little black cat got bigger and bigger and bigger. And one day, just like the kid used to do, he was playing with the black cat. And it scratched him. And the black cat just licked the blood. And the nature, his natural instinct came alive and killed the kid. And the mom came to the Indian chief all frustrated and upset about what happened to her kid. And then he started letting her know, I tried to warn you, never take it home. But she didn't listen. Sometimes we got to understand that sin will cost us more than we ever intended to pay. And keep us longer than we ever wanted to stay. Amen. The devil gets you thinking, man, I'm just going to do it one time. Just, just one time. I'm just going to slip up. Just, I'm going to go visit that man or visit that lady just, just one time. 
I'm going to go into that place that they spin around and do things on pole just one time. It's not going to hurt. I'm going to make that extra phone call with that worker so just one time. You can't trust your flesh. Amen. Like I told the one person, well, Pastor, I know that I, I know how to handle my liquor. You may you might be able to handle your liquor a thousand and fifteen times. But it's just that one time you don't handle it. It's going to cost you the rest of your life. Amen. Don't make opportunity. The Bible says, make no room for the flesh. Amen. We're not supposed to make any room for the devil. We're not supposed to make any room for the adversary of us. You've got too much to lose. Amen. We've got to understand our family is dependent upon us. Our kids are dependent upon us. Our wife is dependent upon us. Amen. You don't have when your future spouse is dependent upon you. Amen. You don't know that there's a city, there's people, there's community, there's kids. You don't know who's looking at you. Get strength every day that you're walking with God. Hallelujah. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call we got to understand, understand that the times that we're in, knowing that we're upon, the end times is upon us, because it says in the scripture that all nations shall hate Israel. And Israel is starting to say now, all nations hate us. The end is coming. A lot of nations are coming against Israel. And for the first time ever, Israel has been finding itself getting whooped. And guess what happened when the people of God got whooped? They learn how to get on their knees. And then God came to rescue them. How many times you've been whipped by the enemy, but you made it to the prayer room? How many times you almost thought you were going to give in the town, but you made it to the prayer room? And you started to realize how real God is in your life. You started to realize the power and the grace and the nourishing power of God that God has able to sustain us through the darkest and evil times of our life. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourself. Amen. Let's, let's make a vow this year not to be so negative. Let's make a vow this year not to talk so negative against our brothers and our sisters. Amen. To forgive one another. Amen. The Bible says when you pray, stand, forgive. Amen. We need to forgive one another. We all have made issues. We all made mistakes. We're going to do each other wrong. Amen. But we got to learn to forgive. For that is the blessing and the grace of God. And we got to save ourselves. Praise God. As we look at uh, the fundamentals of doctrine. As far as baptism. Some may trouble you and say that you need to be baptized. And the title is Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I might beg to differ. The story of the book, the book of Acts. We're going to go to Acts 4 and 10. Where there was a man at the gate. And he got healed. And they were asking him about it. And then one of the apostles started to talk about Acts 4 and 10. And give the formulation for baptism. Acts 4 and 10 says. Be it known unto you all. And to all the people of Israel. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Whom you crucified. Whom God has raised from the dead. Even by him does this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set not. For your builders, and it became the head of the corner. Acts 4 and 12. Neither, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. This is a Jesus name, church. Amen. But when you get into, I'm not going back to my old ways, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5 17. What does 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us? It gives us instruction about living for God. What does it mean? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things are old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hey, there's some things that we used to do before we live for God that we need to give up. There's some attitudes, attributes, bitterness, 
Amen. Sometimes bitterness eats you up from the inside. Amen. Bitterness is nothing but detrimental to your soul. Bitterness is so ineffective in your life. It's like you drinking a gallon of bleach. The person you're bitter against, you hope it affects them. It won't happen. It only eats you from the inside. As a new creation in Christ, salvation is not merely an adjustment of habits, but it's complete spiritual transformation. You gotta have this mind that was in you that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. You gotta get to lay down your life. You gotta lay down that old life. That lay down that old lifestyle. Sometimes you gotta lay down them old friends. Amen. Because if they're not helping you, they might be hurting you. Amen. We gotta cut off them things that wanna pull us back to that old lifestyle. I remember having some of my old friends who were like, Joseph, we miss how you used to be. We missed how you used to talk. We missed how you used to entertain us. And I told them, I said, give me good, one good reason to come back and I'll do it. And they couldn't give me one good reason to walk out on God. Amen. You never have a good reason to walk out on God. I'm going to tell you, I love every single one of you. But there's no one in church big enough to stop me from walking with God. Amen. The preacher's not big enough to stop me walking with God. My wife, my kids are not big enough to stop me walking with God. Why? It's all about him. Amen. And last time I checked, Jesus is the only one that died for us. Amen. You're not here for me. You're not here for anyone in this facility. You're here because of Jesus. And he said, you didn't choose me. He said, I chose you. He had chose you to be a witness he has chosen you to be an example. He has chosen you to be a light in this dark world. And as the world continues to get darker, God's light is going to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. Amen. Glory to God. The significance of being a new creature. Amen. There's a lot of things I don't have to worry about. Amen. There's a lot of trouble. I don't have to look over my neck because I'm doing stuff I, I used to do. Amen. I, I, I'm not going to say his name, but I know a big drug dealer in the city. And a lot of times I see him walking, he's always looking over his back. Is somebody going to get me? Is this my day? One time I had to help him out. I had to take him to a facility so he could wash up. He had some issues with the water. And he's terrified to death. He's in his big house. He probably watching Scarface, thinking they're going to finally come get him. He got his bag, and he's just terrified, walking up in the house. What if somebody's if there's a set of them, I got an ambush. Terrified. Got his bags. One of somebody about to get me. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to live like that. It doesn't pay. When we exercise the old self passed away. Amen. That old man, you gotta understand that the devil don't love you. Raise your hand if the devil ever did anything good for you. We have no testimony that the devil's ever did anything good for us. The scripture does not lie. It says the thief comes what? To kill, steal, and destroy. How I many the devil didn't kill some of your family members because of the bad lifestyle? Raise your hand. How I many the devil stole things from you? How many times the devil destroyed things in your life? Destroyed your marriage, destroyed your kids, destroyed your loved ones. What is your hand God ever did you wrong? Why would you want to? Why wouldn't you want to serve a God like that? Why do you want to want to serve a God that has your best interests in mind, that loves you when you don't even want to love yourself? That's the kind of God loves us. Praise be to God. We got to understand as there's a call for holiness. He said, "Be ye holy, for I am holy." Amen. We need to live separate, a separate lifestyle. Amen. Not just in dress and spirit, but also in the inner person. Amen. We don't need to walk arrogantly, high-minded, thinking we're better than anybody. Amen. Last time I checked, you're not better than anybody. I'm not better than anybody. Amen. Only by the grace of God, I'm not in a meth house. Only by the grace of God, I'm not in a crack house. Only by the grace of God, I'm not this and that and anything under this world that's displeasing to God. It's because of the grace of God. I am what I am. Hallelujah. We understand as believers, our call is sanctification. 
separate from the ways of this world. We don't need to embrace the fashions and dressings of this world. Why? Because we want to reflect God. We want to reflect our identity in Christ. Our lifestyle must demonstrate an inward change that Christ is making in our life. We understand, I'm not going to look back. We're going to go to uh, Luke 9, 62. The danger of looking back. 962, and Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I want you to think about that for a second. The moment you start looking back, we know we hear about the story of the Marines and, and the Navy SEALs, and, and they have that bail. And sometimes they get frustrated or they get worn out through the push ups, the swimming, and the, the Stringent exercise and just trying to break them mentally, break them physically. And they all, the instructor says, Hey, when you give up, just go ring that bell and you're done. And there's one guy going to ring the bell, and his friend's like, Don't! Don't ring that bell! And the instructor said, Leave him alone. Because he already made up his mind. There's nothing you can do. And what did Jesus say? He that has his hands to plow. And looking back to ring the bell is not fit for the kingdom of God. Get that look back out of your spirit. We have, must have a commitment to press forward. Once we even commit to following Christ, we cannot afford to turn back on our old ways. Amen. Forgive me for a lot of personal references, but I didn't have a family growing up. Amen. Bless God, I had my grandfather. He adopted me when I was a kid. But I don't know what it's like to call a man dad in my life. I never had a dad in my life. I didn't know what it's like to go on a family trip and, and have a dad. And, and sometimes I get memorized and I cry because I have a family. And I, I got a little daughter saying, Dad, I love you. My son saying, Dad, I love you. And I just think about all the years of growing up. I never had that in my life. And it's only because the grace of God, I got a family. It's the grace of God, I got a wife and we stick it out. We don't always get along. We always, we, I'm telling you, I'm, a, I'm trying to be better. But you understand, our preacher is very stubborn. Yes. Amen. We got to be able to put up with the devil and all y'all at the same time. Hallelujah. But I'm a very stubborn man. I got, I got a strong will. Amen. Do you know this is all glory to God? When I had a sight nerve, I could barely walk. Do you know, on the, the first week of me having a sight nerve, I had a stretch and I was in so much pain to get myself in the church van so I could be at church. And I had to basically lean against this pulpit to preach for 45 minutes. And all I did was come to church and preach and lay in the bed in pain all day for three weeks. And then when I got to about the third week, I was able to go to the job sites with the workers. But that's all I did. I was like, I'm going to be in church. And I was sitting and my wife's like, baby, you can cancel. I said, no, I can't cancel. I can't do it. Just in all that pain. And then after the first, second week, I lost my pain pills. So I was just in pain for three weeks straight. But I had determined, I can't look back. Focus on looking forward to dedication. The danger of distraction. And for the past life. And sometimes we can think about, the devil can make you think you had it better in the world. You had it better. You didn't have to fight all that stuff. You didn't have all the trials. You didn't have all the temptation. When you weren't living for God, but now you live for God, everything is coming up against you. Why? Because the enemy's letting you know, I know you're living for God, and I'm trying my best to stop you. Lot's wife, Genesis 19.26. Genesis 19.26. Can we understand that Lot's wife was one of the first people to look back? But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. God had to, took the angels and delivered them out of the city where God was about to destroy it with fire and brimstone. And all she did was look back. And God turned into a pillar of salt. Why did God do that? Because he didn't want the whole family looking back. So God made an example out of her. Amen. I'm about to close. Uh, numbers 11, 5 through 6. Can you imagine the children of Israel get whipped? Hey, you're not bringing enough brick! Then Moses came out and said, Hey, they need to be delivered. The God of Israel said, Let my people go. And 
king of Pharaoh, Pharaoh the Egyptian king, he's like, who is this God you're talking about? God. The Hebrews? And you know, can you just imagine what was going through Pharaoh's mind? At that time, in Egyptian culture, Pharaoh was known as God. And he said, you're trying to say there's another God beside me? And I need to listen to this God? And then you just imagine Pharaoh's mind, your God is so powerful, but your people enslaved it to me. And I need to listen to you? Or are you crazy? He's like, I don't even know this God you're talking about. Because a matter of time, you're going to find out. And the people of Israel, they used to get whipped and beat by the Egyptians. And just a short time, we've got to understand, just a short time of being delivered, walking with God, you can forget everything God did for you. Now that God delivered them out of Egypt, delivered them out of slavery, delivered them out of bondage, and they're sitting back and saying, we remember the fish where we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions. And the garlic. Now they say, man, we remember the old garlic fish. And you forgot about the beating. You forgot about the abusement. You forgot how the devil took advantage of your family, took advantage of your morale, took advantage of everything. But now you're thinking about you had it better with the devil than you had it with God. Like Sister Karen said, the devil is a liar. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now, God used to give them those it like a golden wafer. It's like a big old honeycomb. Every morning and fed the people of Israel. One, in, I think it was one in the morning and one in the evening. And they was not supposed to take any more than that one honeycomb. If they took it over, they would spoil the next day. But on the Sabbath day, they was able to take double so it could mass on the Sabbath so they didn't have to work. But they got tired of the provision that God gave them. God I'm comfortable. Is that this all you got for me, God? And all I had to do was say, pray, God, I want something else. God, can you give us some need? And God would have did it freely. You know, that's just like sometimes I have a word. I mean, uh, that's another story. Praise God. Let me get back to this. Getting back, getting back business. <laughs> Amen. We said, craving for past comforts led to spiritual stagnation. Amen. I used to be like this and that, man. Take away the memories. Throw the clothes out of the closet. Hey, don't make no bridgeways. Go back to the world. Hey, closing. The power of God's grace is enough to sustain us. Titus 2, 11 to 12. Hallelujah. The power of God's grace. Mm. Now, what does the grace of God teach us? 2 and 11 to 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. What is God saying? God's given an opportunity for every single individual in our world to be saved. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking, hallelujah, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior. Jesus Christ. What is grace teaching us? I need to live for God. What is grace teaching me? I need to walk with God. What is grace teaching me? There's some things that I can't do. Why? Because I'm walking with God. And that worldly lust. Hey Amen. I was on Instagram today. I had us unfollow some things. Why? It's entertaining my lust. Hey Amen. There's some social media things you got to unfollow. Why? Because they're going to stir up that lust in your heart. you got to crucify the flesh with the affections and the lust therefore. Why? The enemy understands how we work. He understands every man is drawn away and tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And every woman, he sees something that you want. He sees something that appeals to your flesh and he throws it at you. And if you take a bite, he throws another one. And he throws another one. Until you finally reel you in into Charlotte's way and got you destroyed. Cut it off. <coughs> Cut it off. Cut off every work of the flesh. Cut it off. The Bible says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Why? It's worth going. I gotta be saved. I gotta be saved. I got too much at stake to be playing with my soul. Hallelujah. We 
understand that grace not only enables us to understand that we have sin in our life and to ask God for forgiveness. It also empowers us to live differently. God's grace instructs us to turn away from sin and embrace the righteous living. I'm sorry. If you claim to be a Christian and you're living for the devil and you're doing everything under the sun that's ungodly, you are not a Christian. I don't care if you speak in tongues a, a thousand times a day. If you're not embracing obedience to the words of Christ and walking in the light as he is in the light, you have no fellowship with him. Amen. It don't matter what you say. The Bible says in James, don't be just a, a hearer of the word, but be a doer. That man should be blessed in deed. God's grace instructs us to turn away from sin and embrace a righteous living. We understand that the grace of God is transformative. Amen. You got to live with purpose and sobriety. We are called to be sober, righteous, have a godly life, aware of our spiritual purpose. What has God called you to do? Amen. One of the main things is to live for Him, to be a light, to win souls, to be effective in your community, to be effective in your neighborhood, to be effective in your workplace. Amen. There should be a beacon, a lighthouse of hope in your environment you work at, and you're it. Why? Because you walk in the light. As He is in the light. Amen. God is coming on us to be that light. Amen. When pressure persecution arises and they try to destroy us and it's coming against every corner of our life and we don't bend in and break the world's able to know they got something different they got something I don't have and I want it hallelujah we gotta understand the practical ways to live our faith daily how do you live your faith daily how are you walking with God? Is this is it just a Sunday thing to come to church? Read a couple of scriptures? Are you daily walking with God? Amen. The people you took advantage of and did wrong, are you making it right? Are you asking for forgiveness? Are you dwelling with your wife according to knowledge? Amen. Are you trying to make that environment, that house, a home? Are you doing everything you can to make it better for your for significant other you have in your life? Or are you aggravating, you pressure them? You come undo stress upon their lives. Mm. We understand there's a contrast between the old and the ungodly life and a new life in Christ. We had a life that we used to live in the old times. Anything the flesh wanted to do. Girl, are you going to the club? Yes, I'm going to the club. Tear the club up. Man, go on, man. I'm going to hang out. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to chase this and chase that. An ungodly life. The lifestyle of Hollywood and a lot of our entertainers is very ungodly. And a new life in Christ. You know what? No, sister. I'm not going. I'm going to the church. It's time to have a prayer meeting. Hey, I'm going to get together. I'm going to live for God. We're going to talk about the things of God. There's a transformation in our lifestyle that's pleasing to God. The armor, uh, scripture reading Ephesians 6 to 10. Almost about to wrap it up. The armor against regression. I want to talk a little bit about the armor against regression. How can you protect yourself? How can you protect your mind, your spirit, and your heart from going back to what you used to be? Ephesians 6, 10 to 11. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord. Finally, my sister, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His life. Hey, we need to start leaning on God more than we ever have in our lives. We need to start trusting God more than we ever had in our life. Why? Because the days are evil. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And the Bible says that he's come down with great wrath. Why? Because he has a short time. He wants to destroy and damage as many people's lives as he possibly can. Because he can't go to heaven and he sure don't want you to go either. 
I understand this that sometimes we have a struggle and we think it's our coworker. We think it's just a person we work with. But you gotta understand, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Sometimes the devil has people set in position that are very wicked, very evil, and very immoral people. To punish, to afflict, to stress the people of God. To bring your armor and your faith down to nothing. But be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Wherefore, take unto thee the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, withstand in that evil day. The evil day is coming against all of us. And having done all to stand, therefore take unto all to stand. Praise God. We understand that the spiritual... Uh, warfare, excuse me, where, wherefore, wherefore, <laughs> warfare, awareness. Our old lifestyle is a target of the enemy, and you will try to use it against us. We got to understand that your old lifestyle that you used to live and the old things that you used to enjoy doing, that is the enemy's target to try to bring you back to that old lifestyle again. He knows what you used to enjoy and indulge in this used to, and he's going to try to reel you back in. He's going to try to throw that in your face. He's going to try to make an easy opportunity for you to slip up in that again. We understand that. We understand the devil has strategies to lure us back in bondage. As I talked about earlier, he is not your friend. He doesn't want to see you in heaven. He doesn't want to see you blessed. He doesn't want to see you living for God. He doesn't want to see your family together. He doesn't want to see your marriage together. He wants to see your family broken and destroyed. That is his job. We need the spiritual vigilance of walking with God. Amen. You got to understand when the devil's trying to destroy you, don't take that lightly. When the devil's trying to wear you out, wear your day out so you can't pray and get a hold of God, don't take that lightly. That is a strategic attack of the enemy to destroy you and to bring down your defenses so he can attack you and destroy you. What does the enemy do against the wolf pack? He separates them. And then he goes after the weak. The enemy is trying to separate you out of the church, out of the house of God. Why? So he can make an attack upon your life. And he's not going to stop there. He's not happy just getting dad. He's not happy just getting mom. He's not happy just getting the kids. But if he can destroy your life forever, that's going to bring pleasure to him. Make no room for the adversary. Make no room to for the flesh to fulfill the desires and lusts thereof. As we talk about equipping ourselves daily, the necessity of putting the whole armor of God, you're, you're not going to make it without a prayer life. You're not going to make it without a walk with God. Amen. Sister Westbrook, you say you've got to learn how to pray. Practical applications, prayer, fasting, scripture, scripture meditation, and fellowship with the believers. Amen. There's a fellowship. It's not like fellowship with the people of God. Amen. If you don't have a friend, you look around. There's over 35 people friends here. And Tim that must have friends must show himself friendly. Amen. There's people that love to spend time with you. They love to talk to you. They love to have you over. They love to Right on God together. Amen. Let's get united as a family, a church family of God. Final scripture. Philippians 3, 13 through 14. Brother, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. Mm. I press. And if you keep pressing, you don't have to look forward. Look back. Keep pressing. Keep working with God. I know some of you are in a trial right now. You do a financial trial. You do a stressful trial that's coming against your life, coming against your finances. But I'm here to tell you, keep pressing. Hey, the sun's coming out one day. Brighter days ahead. 
I press toward the mark and the pride, prize of the call of God in Christ Jesus. Declare with confidence, I refuse to go back. I'm not going to let anything in this world take me out of the church. I'm not going to let anything in this world take me back to this old lifestyle. I'm not going to let the devil get any more glory out of my life. You got a purpose in heart. Amen. You got a purpose in heart. Devil, I'm never going to ever let you put your filthy hands on my life again. Never going to let you put your filthy hands on my family, on my marriage, on my kids. I refuse to let you have me in my life. A life in Christ is a life forward momentum. Hey, if you're not living for God with more sin than you did last year, it's time to turn up the heat. The world may attempt to alert you to go back with false promises. Hey, if you, if you do this, you do that. Hey, it's going to be better for you. False, empty promises. But we are strengthened by the power of God. Remember, your old lifestyle is not worthy of your new identity that you have in Christ. Let us live intentionally guarding our hearts and pursuing God with unwavering devotion. Amen. Let's devote ourselves to God. Let's walk with God. Let's stand for God. Amen. God is more important than any issue that we have going on in our life. Amen. And I know sometimes we have issues that we can't be in church and on time and all that. Hey, we understand that the devil's making opportunities for you to be late. He's had everything happen up. Amen. Start preparing the day before. Amen. We're going we're gonna to get it together. Why? we got to be in church. God's got a word for us. God's going to strengthen us. God's going to help us. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. We love y'all. Amen. Amen. We'll open up for some prayer. Somebody needs the Holy Ghost. Amen. You got to become believer. You want to be a new Christian? You need the Holy Ghost. God, I can't live for you without the Holy Ghost. God, I can't please you without the Holy Ghost. You need to have that set in your mind. When you come praying, I want you to confess your sins before God. God, what's in my life that you're not pleased with? Please with? God, what do I need to change? God, what do I need to rearrange? And you've got to be willing. The Bible says the willing obedience, seek the good of the land. you got to be willing and obedient to be obedient to the things of God. And then you start confessing your sins. You start lifting your hands up without fear, wrath, or doubt. And you start making your proclamation known upon how God I need you. God I worship. And God wants to hear the fruits of your lips. God loves hearing worship. God loves hearing praise. God wants to hear you brag. God, I love you. God, I need you. God is not like thee. God, you have all power and strength in heaven. And you start to magnify the Lord. And you're going to start to entertain his presence. And you're going to feel the Holy Ghost come. Like I feel it now. Hallelujah. You're going to feel the Holy Ghost come. And you just give yourself over to the place of God. And you will fill up the Holy Ghost. Whatever the speaking to. And God is nigh to every one of us. I had a situation where a guy was in Walmart yesterday. And he was higher than a kite. And he said, Preacher, I hate that you see him in this way. I said, Let me pray for you. I said, Can I lay hands? He said, No, don't lay hands. I said, That's okay. Put my hand. He said, No, I don't want to lay hands. I said, No problem. I said, Man, I know how big God is. I don't even have to touch you. I start calling on God. I'm calling upon the God of Abraham. Call upon the God of Isaac. God, touch this vessel. God, put your hand all over him. Let him feel your anointing. Let him feel your glory. Let him feel your power, oh God. And the power of God came all over that man. That's not real what God is. God don't need us, but he wants us. God don't need us, but he wants us. How many of y'all want God? Let's come to the front. Let's pray. Let's rededicate ourselves back to God. Let's rededicate ourselves to holiness and separation from the world. And let's dedicate ourselves for a move of the Holy Ghost that you have never seen before. Amen. God's able to do it. He's looking for a willing vessel. God's wondering right now, who can I use? Who can I use? Like I said, said send me, Lord. Hallelujah. We get some music and let's pray. Everybody praying. 
Everybody, even the kids. We want to see y'all come up here and pray. Amen. Come use that energy. Give it to God. Hallelujah.